betrayed you for riches untold. You are, you are my everything. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. No, no. I wouldn't trade must be number one in our life. And when you find him to be that, he becomes everything. Praise God. Amen. Let's enter in today into worship and praise and hearing the word of God. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here. As I've said many times, I better, I'd rather be here than the best hospital bed in town. Amen. Praise God. And we can be there quickly and we don't know it. I went to a young man's funeral yesterday went out 50 some years old and he was snatched out just like that and it, it makes you think about the goodness of Jesus and how that when you walk with him you don't have to worry about the end time amen I don't have to worry about it right now because I know that I'm walking in his precepts and as long as I do that there's peace in my mind if you don't have peace this morning you can have it all you have to do is ask. Praise God. I'm thankful for the presence of God that's here today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Mighty God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings and your spirit we feel here today. We thank you for each one that's here. And God, as we come to lift you up in praise, that we ask that your anointing of the Holy Ghost would walk up and down in these vessels and these tabernacles. And God, we hear your word and we apply it to our mind and to our soul. We, God, ask you, Lord, to move upon each one. And God, when we leave here, we come away a different person. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. We give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. We're going to ask Brother Gary to come and teach with us this morning and give us the word of God he has on his heart. Praise the Lord, everyone. Give me just a moment.
about you, but I'm extremely grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I have a text that I'm going to read. Um, it's not very long, beginning in Genesis chapter 39. Five scriptures, you, you don't have to stand or remain seated. Um, I'm going to be re- reading verses 7 through 12. Genesis chapter 39, it says, And it came to pass, after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. By the help of the Lord this morning, I, I want to talk on this, this topic, this lesson, a garment for the season garment for the season. Preparing for this morning, uh, I couldn't help but to think about how blessed uh, I am, we all are, to be a part of Abundant Faith Church. We have a tremendous pastor. That's where you stop. Did I do that right? Did I do that? Is that what you told me? That's it. Seriously, every time he takes the mic, he feeds us. He ministers to us. Every time he teaches, does a Bible study, does a lesson. I told him a few weeks ago, he's teaching the apostolic lifestyle. I've been in church. I'm 43 years old. I've been in the apostolic lifestyle my entire life. And I am seeing things in a deeper way and in a different way than I ever have. But not just our pastor, we have an incredible ministerial team here. Every time one of the ministers at this church gets up and speaks, they feed my soul. And don't you know in this hour that we're living in how important that is? Every time that you get up and you watch the news and you see all the things that are going on, listen, we're not in the last days. We are in the last and the final hours. And that said this morning, I don't take lightly when I'm presented with an opportunity to speak. This isn't just something that you throw down on a piece of paper in hoping of getting up here and and say something that's Instagram worthy or or Facebook worthy or t-shirt printable. That's not what this is about. Because this is the final hours in the final days. And there are souls that need a touch and lives that need to be ministered to. See, sitting at home on the Sunday of daylight savings time, my pastor's wife was so, so incredibly kind to not put me on the schedule that Sunday, probably because she knows that I'm grumpy with a left hour of uh, sleep, but I wasn't on the schedule that Sunday, and I'm sitting at home, and that's where the thought for this morning came from, is we have this big old decorative clock in our living room. And it hangs up on the right side of the living room. And, uh, of course, you know, the Apple Watch, the the, the iPad, the the microwave, the the stove, all of those other things aren't enough to be able to tell what time it is. You have to have the big clock. By a show of hands this morning, how many people have the decorative clock? Yeah, look. Never even look at it. How many in this room have not changed the time on the decorative clock? Yeah, we had, a, we had less hands, but we had a lot of hands. And I was struck with a thought 
on that morning? What if I didn't change the time? What if I didn't change the clock? What if I didn't change the microwave or the stove? What if I refused to acknowledge the hour of change? What if I refused to do it? I would be late for job estimates, and I would lose the job because I was late. I would say Sister Maroney would probably stop scheduling me to do music. Why? Because I would never be here on time for music practice. Eventually, pastor would stop scheduling me to teach or to preach because I wouldn't be here. I would be late. I'd be late for everything. Yet we've all seen that guy, sometimes the lady. You know the one that just couldn't let high school go? You know what I'm talking about. He's like he lives in a different hour. He comes rolling up in the 88 Trans Am. You don't even have to see him step out of the car. You know there's going to be loud 80s hair band music playing. Whitewashed jeans and a tie-dyed t-shirt. Sporting a mullet. Let it grow. Whew. Looks out of place. Looks like he's stuck in a time capsule. See, the garments that he had on wasn't for or wasn't made for this hour. I often associate garments to a, a, a season in my life. In eighth grade, I did a, a lesson upstairs in the pulse, and I'm kind of adapting that for today. Um, I didn't think a, a fashion show would work well in the uh, adult Bible class. I was trying to be funny, and it worked. It was, it was good. I had a, um, not to sound self-serving, but I had a Gary fashion show. Now, that might not sound funny, but if you saw pictures of me in eighth grade, you would know that that was hilarious. Sweatpants. And a t-shirt that was slightly too tight with big glasses and a flat top. Swatting the ladies away with a stick. Not. I can't to this day see a, pe a, a pair of purple jeans or a silk shirt or a rayon shirt and not think of high school. Whew. You don't know what it's like to dress up to church until you wear a purple suit. Ho, oh, ho, ho, ho. We had a guy at, at, at church camp. We called him Joe Purple. Where's Brother Hedges at? We had Joe Purple. Why? Because he had a different purple suit for every night of church. I had an electric blue suit with a black silk shirt that had electric blue lightning on it with white jig jags. They're here this morning. It's their fault. I can't to this day see a loud suit on someone who hasn't moved past that time period and not think about it. My Campbellsville University coach the marching tigers was salvaged from the tornado at my mom and dad's house. Not even a tornado could blow that thing away. Whew. I see that and I think of white plumes and white marching shoes. I had someone dress up as Toyota Gary. Yeah. Centos Gary. And I had Brother Noah, for those who are curious as to why he was here in painter's whites and a hoodie, as Ashlock Painting Gary. Now, I did it, and I associated each of those garments.
to a season in my life, to an area and something that I learned from that season. Those garments in your life might be slightly different than the ones that are in mine. Hopefully they're different than the jogging pants. <laughs> but I associated each of those seasons to a garment. The discipline that came from learning to practice an instrument. College, going and thinking that life was going to work out one way and it not having your hopes and dreams dashed. We all have something like that. And when I look at that Campbellsville University jacket, that's what I'm reminded of. When I see a Toyota shirt or someone out in the Toyota, I think about that season in my life where I was growing up, that I was maturing, that I was trying to learn some things. And I could go on and on this morning about that. But each of those represented a phase in my life. You see, if I came here this morning dressed in jogging pants and a t-shirt, just after Pastor cut the live feed, I would probably, when y'all stopped laughing, I would probably escort it off the platform. <laughs> Why? Because the garment wouldn't fit the hour. If I showed up to estimate a house for my business, dressed in head-to-toe Cintas gear, that customer may look at me and think, what are you doing? I thought you were a painter. It's one of the reasons why I encourage my guys to wear painter's whites, because it's instantly identifiable. It's a garment that's identified with a painter. You see a painter in a store, you know they're a painter because their pants are white. You see, as I prepared for this lesson this morning, God put a question in my spirit. That wasn't me this time. This time. I checked it three times before I came up here. Oh, back to that question. How can God move us into another season if we cling to the garment of a different season? I can remember being a... Uh, a youth musician, and sitting on the right side of Apostolic Holiness Church, waiting for that head nod. You get it? <laughs> hey, unless it happens about 13 or 14 more times, you're good. That's my record, in case you're wondering. The last time I taught, I think my phone went off about 13 times. And I was up here going, why won't someone turn their phone off? I don't know. Why didn't you turn your phone off? I can remember sitting on the right side of that church. And I'd sit right there. And I would stare right here. And many from my generation will know why. You were waiting for the head nod. I was waiting for Brother Kenny Moore, Brother Kenny Johnson, or Johnny Craner, or some redheaded dude to give the head nod. Because the head nod means it's my turn. And I will never forget Brother Kenny Moore giving me the head nod in the youth service. Whew. I don't think I ever ran faster in my life. It was my shot. And I found out in that moment that I could keep time. And, and I worked at it. And it opened a door in my life and a passion and a love for music. And I would play for camp. Drums for camp. And trumpet for camp. And sax for camp. And it all started with just a head nod. Because it was something in me that rose up that was like, man, I love this. I want to do this. I see that same thing in our youth today. I'm sitting up here during practice 
with Brother Noah Ragani with my jaw on the floor. If you haven't heard me brag yet, here it goes. My eighth grade son tried out for Allstate and made it. Seventh overall. Officially, I can stand up here and say he's the best eighth grade trumpet player in the state of Indiana. That's awesome. Right? Oh, you ain't got to clap for that. I'll let you. Go ahead. Y'all want to stand too? That's great. But I didn't realize the gravity of what it would be like to be on the other side of the head nod. We see it. It's something I didn't appreciate when I was younger. But all the young drummers coming up. And all the young acoustic players. And my, my son who just suddenly became fixated on saxophone, starts sending me random videos of him playing scales. And it's awesome. But I've been a little saddened too. Because as I've adulted, and you know what it's like. Did you know your pastor, he is a good drummer? He is fantastic. But to be on the other side of that head nod and to notice as your skills begin to diminish because you don't use them is awesome. And I'm reminded of an incredible piece of advice that I have repeated behind this mic multiple times about Brother Kevin saying to me that if you want your ministry to grow, find a hole and fill it. But the thing is, the thing that I am learning is that as you grow older, if you're not careful, if you wrap your identity into a position or into one or two things within the kingdom of God, as those holes shift, what is your willingness to change garments for the hour? What is your willingness to make way for the youth that are coming up and, and your willingness to show God that you're not position-minded, but kingdom-minded. And what is it that I can do today, in this moment, in this hour, for the kingdom? The thing that I'm learning is that God has a garment for this season. And if we aren't careful... We can hold on to a garment that we need to release. We can ask God to grow us and change us in this season, but want to hold on to who we were in a different season. And most everyone here this morning, you're familiar with the story of Joseph. Israel, Jacob, he loved Joseph more than all his children. It says because he was the son of his old age. He made him a garment, a coat of many colors. Three times. Three times Joseph is identified by that garment. I don't know if that's what it looked like or not. But if it seems ridiculous that his brothers may have gotten upset about a coat, you know, there's one other reference outside of Joseph to a coat or a garment of many colors. It's in 2 Samuel 13, 18, and it's Tamar, King David's daughter, being referred to as wearing an ornate robe of many colors. It was reserved for royalty. And maybe that should hint at why Joseph's coat made his brother so angry. You have to understand, Joseph's family, he, they couldn't go down to Target or Nordstrom's back in the day. Most of their garments, they were just monochrome. They were just a single color with a, a hole cut out. Any vibrant color, such as purple, usually signaled royalty or someone with an abundance of riches. 
And whether that coat came in a, a variety of colors or sleeves were sewn in, depending on which scholar you ask, Jacob made it clear that he saw his son Joseph better than any of his other offspring. Joseph would parade around in a physical reminder of Jacob's favoritism. Jacob made his message clear. He loved one son more than the others. And the other sons wouldn't have it, so they took action. Ultimately, that coat does kind of show how a generation can repeat mistakes. You see, if there was anyone that should have understand, understood the frustration of favoritism, it would have been Jacob, because Isaac favored Esau over him. But instead of breaking the cycle, he ups the ante, and he gives Joseph this garment. And you know the story. Joseph dreamed a dream. He dreamed about them all binding sheaves in a field. His sheaf arose, and their sheaves bowed to his. This, as you can imagine, it made his brothers angry. He again dreamed. And this time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars made obvious to him. And his brothers envied him, is the word that it used. They envied him. But his dad observed the failure. It was these dreams that led to the plot against Joseph. They were going to kill him. They were going to. And if, if it had not been for Reuben, they would have. But they decided to throw him in a pit and take that coat and rip it apart and dip it in animal blood and convince Israel that he was dead. And they sold him to a company of Ishmaelites going into Egypt. The brothers have rid themselves of the dreamer. In their eyes, they just squashed any possibility of those dreams coming true. This was a devastating deception to Israel. It says that Jacob rent his clothes. He mourned for his son many days. It broke his heart. He wept for his son. And Joseph ends up being sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain of the guard. He was favored. Nothing in the house of Potiphar wasn't Joseph's. It says that all that Potiphar had was in his hand. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She said, lie with me. We read this scripture. It's obvious that Potiphar's wife was attracted to him. And it says that day by day by day, this wasn't a one-time occurrence. It was a daily thing. Maybe at first it started off playful. Maybe. But then it turned serious. But then the word says that a moment arose where no one else was around. And she grabs him by the garment and says, lie with me. And it says that he left that garment in her hand. And he fled. It says that he got him out. And I don't want to focus this morning solely on Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. I don't even want to focus solely on his decision to flee. It's often the part of the story that we talk about, Pastor, when we're talking about temptation or sinning. It's leave the garment and get you out. If you have something that you're struggling with, uh, addiction, and you feel that temptation coming on, leave the garment and get you out. And he didn't want to sin against God. And I don't want to focus on the part of the story that would have placed him in a prison for two years as a result of that decision. I want to focus this morning on that garment. You see, that garment was a very important garment. It would be from the lineage of Joseph that King David would come. And it would be through the lineage of David that Jesus would be born. And that garment was very, very important. The moment he chose to leave that garment behind 
the future history of the nation of Israel was written. You see, it was bigger than his brothers bowing before him and his father bowing before him. It was bigger than him being second in the land of all of Egypt. It was much, much bigger than that. His decision to place his character above his position and relinquish the garment would later position him for a kingly garment and a ring. But it did so much more than that. As a result of leaving that garment behind, the 12 tribes of Israel would be saved from the famine. The history of the nation of Israel could have played out differently as a result of Joseph's decision in that moment if he had held on to the thing he relinquished. Holding on to garments that we should relinquish can do more to us spiritually than simply walking around out of style. Holding on to garments that we should relinquish can alter our future and the future of the generations after us. There was a lot in play in that moment between Joseph and Potiphar's wife. That garment, it represented many things. He had dreamed two dreams. It's safe to say that being sold into slavery, he might have thought that those dreams were long dead. It's safe to say this morning that while he was even in prison for two years, he assumed that those prisons, that his dreams were, were dead, that they were not going to happen. See, he didn't know what was coming. He didn't make that decision in that moment for any other reason than his character. That he did not want to sin against God. I can't help but think for a moment. I'm, I'm a little dramatic. Uh, many have used the words drama and queen. Is that okay to say? Just mute that. Just mute it. Pull it out. But I can be dramatic. Most people with a temper can be dramatic at times. But one of the great things about being dramatic, Bishop, is I can see things kind of play out in my mind at times. I love doing illustrated sermons. It's one of the reasons why I did what I did upstairs with them and talking about the garments and allowing them to see. And, and doing it the way I did was because I like drama. One of my favorite things as a kid growing up was I loved doing Christmas drama. Memorizing thousands of lines and being dramatic. And I'd like to think that I'm somewhat of a Shakespearean actor. But it all hinged on a decision. I can see in my mind's eye, Joseph standing in the room doing his business. And the call comes out for the garment or for the for the soldiers that are there to leave. There's a meeting. She realizes she has him alone. She goes over to him. She grabs a hold that garment I can see it in my mind as maybe he was pulled towards her for just a brief moment and in that moment he thinks the last time I left a garment I ended up sold into slavery maybe he thinks for a moment God gave me these dreams. For what purpose? For what reason? Maybe it just flashes through his mind quickly that it's dead. It's, it's, what's the point? What's, what's the purpose? What's the reason? Why? Why? 
I had those dreams and it, it did nothing but cause my brothers to hate me. And they throw me in a pit and they sell me off as a slave the last time I relinquished the garment. It didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. And now I'm a slave. What's the point? What's the purpose? And he pulls away from her and gets out of there. But I wonder this morning, how many dreams spiritually are squandered because of an inability to relinquish a garment? It didn't play out the way you expected. You didn't expect a pit. You didn't expect a prison. Maybe someone betrayed you, lied on you, cheated on you. Maybe you thought your life was going to go a different way, your ministry a different way, your career a different way. Maybe God showed you all kind of things and nothing has transpired the way you thought it was going to. And the thing that I have to say this morning is that this hour is important and it is not the hour to quit. You have to be willing to relinquish the could have been. You have to be willing to relinquish the should have been. Those are nothing more than a garment for a different season. And if you don't relinquish it for what's ahead for you, the generations after you could forever be altered. You have to be willing to relinquish the garment. Your relevance in this hour is too great not to. It's the one thing that everyone in this room can relate to. There is a garment for you for this season and for this hour. There is a place for you in this place, in this hour, in the kingdom of God. It's a statement that is nearly true for everyone in this place except for one. And that's the person who refuses to relinquish the garment of their past. The Bible uses clothing as an analogy to show how we put on behavior and how we take off behavior that is pleasing to God. Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24, says, Notice how the Apostle Paul describes this in his passage where he teaches how to put off bad habits and put on good habits. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, in Matthew 22, we learn that the garment that we have on matters. There is a proper garment for this hour. When the king came in, to see the guest in Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse number 11. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away. And cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. He was in the house. Brother Hedges, he was sitting at the table. I wonder how many are sitting in the house and sitting at the table of 
the wrong garment on. The thing, if you, you read it, he was, have you ever been wrong in an argument with your spouse? What happens when you're wrong in an argument with your spouse? Oh, that's the one thing everybody can relate to. Holy Ghost. It usually renders you speechless. Mostly because you can't get a word in. For the most part, you're speechless because you don't have the words to come back with it. It occurred to me while reading Matthew 22 that those words, there's a lot that, that hinge on those words that he was speaking. He knew he was supposed to have. The garment on. You see, you may listen to me this morning and think that this is just simply, I, I don't know. He's playing on words. I don't know. But there is a garment for this season. We have to be willing to relinquish some things from our past. We have to be willing to relinquish some things that we've hold on, held on to. I heard a, a, a great story. I, and the whole thing doesn't really, really fit. But in case you're wondering how to catch a baboon, I'm going to tell you this morning. I mean, I don't know if anyone here is on the market to catch a baboon. Uh, but here it goes. Take a salt lick, stick it in a tree. The hollow part of a tree. The hollow part of the tree has to be slightly smaller than the circumference of a baboon's hand. So make sure you measure the baboon's hand before you try this. I didn't know that baboons like salt. Did you know that baboons like salt? They like salt. Baboon or baboon? People are so difficult. Once again, it was going so well. You take a salt lick and stick it in a tree. The baboon's going to, baboon is going to stick his hand in that tree and grab a hold of it because he likes salt. That's all you got to do to catch him because he won't let it go. And then they come and they take him and they throw him in a can. If you want to be free, all you got to do is let it go. That's all you got to do is let it go. Pray and seek his face in this hour. There is a place for everyone. Within the kingdom. I wonder if we could stand across this place. I'm coming to a close. I know we're getting ready to move on to the noon service. But I just I just want to take a moment. If we could all just maybe close our eyes and bow our heads. I wonder if we could just say a prayer in this place right now. Say, God, we love you and we thank you. 
We praise you, God, for your mercy and your grace and your sufficiency. God, I pray right now in this moment that if someone is here holding on to something that they should let go of, that they would let go of it right now in this moment. That there is a different garment they could have for this hour and this season. I pray, God, right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would move in this place. I pray, God, an anointing over our noon service. I pray, God, that you would bless and minister to our pastor today. And let your spirit move in this place in a tremendous way. God, you are good, and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet each other in the name of the Lord. We've got about 10 minutes before the next service. Pastor.